So I'm just going to start out by just saying how unbelievably unfair it is for somebody to have to get up after that unbelievable talk. Um, so uh, I first heard this work on the um, sort of evolution of the genetic mutations in MPNs at the plenary session of the American Society of Hematology about three years ago. Um, even then, I was a little confused, so I was very happy to be here and have it walk through again. But the work that her team is doing has really uncovered a beautiful, beautiful story about humans and about illness versus wellness. And so I just want to say thank you for that talk. That was really beautiful. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is acknowledge also my thanks for being here. Um, it was in 2007 was my first time at this talk, and Ruben Mesa, who I'd met um, at a, a similar talk and given him a, a ride back to his hotel, um, invited me. And it's really helped me in my career to be able to have been introduced to people here. Uh, so I want to thank Ruben. I want to thank the group here that's organized this. And then, as John mentioned, um, my father, a retired surgeon lives down the road about four miles that way. And so I uh, invited him to be here as well. And I'd like to thank him because I wouldn't be in these shoes without his example. So now I'm on to more things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about essential thrombocythemia. And these are my disclosures. Um, I won't be um, violating anything by my discussions today. And I'd like to start a little bit about presentation and diagnosis. And um, we talked a little bit about the fact that people arrive at this final presentation through a variety of routes. And that can be the case here as well. So if we start talking initially at presentation, Sometimes it's what we call an incidental finding. And I would say maybe half of the people that arrive in my clinic arrive there because their primary care doctor did a CBC for some other reason. And they found, for example, that the platelets were a little above normal. Oftentimes, one of the ways that people get uh, referred is because they are pregnant and they have, this is the first time they've actually had a CBC done and their platelet count is elevated. So this is what we consider an incidental finding. It's come up, it's arisen a curiosity, but the patient, unless somebody had looked at their blood smear, wouldn't know. Sometimes it even happens when somebody's given blood, for example. But many times, the presentation is also in the category of what we call symptomatic. So these are people who are presented to a hematologist like myself because of some event they'd happen. And I would say that those events can fall in the category of they've had a blood clot. Now, the blood clots that we think about include pulmonary embolisms, where a group of blood cells block the route of blood uh, through the lung vasculature, and you get areas of the lung that then are starved from blood, and that can be quite painful and quite symptomatic. Sometimes that embolism can happen in other parts of the body. You can get a cerebral venous thrombosis where that same collection of blood cells prevents oxygen from going to the veins that drain the brain. You can get an embolism in the vasculature of the abdominal, uh, the abdominal vessels, so people can have blood clots above their liver, below their liver, or near their spleen. A number of people get uh, discovered to have this disease uh, because of difficulties with pregnancy, and I would say second trimester pregnancies or later, where the fetus is quite dependent on the blood supply through the placenta, and blood clots in that can sometimes cause interuterine disruption and early fetal death. And that sometimes can prompt people to take a look at the placenta for blood clots. It can also have people take a look at the complete blood count. And then they'll notice, oh, this person's had platelets that are two to three times above normal for the last several years. Maybe this is responsible for those clots. Now, many other people are referred because they've had some chronic unexplained symptoms. 
perhaps they've had migraines, and perhaps they've had something that's termed erythromyalgia, which is sort of a hot rash type uh, event that can happen, for example, in the feet or the fingers. Those kind of symptoms, which many people with MPNs are uh, sort of aware of, can sometimes also lead to presentation. Now, once a patient presents, my responsibility is to talk them through all of what diagnosis entails. And it entails, for example, of course, a full history and physical exam. And when we're talking about a history, people will be asking you, what's your family history like? They'll be asking you about the history of cerebral vascular disease or coronary artery disease in your family. It's important to take a look at obstetric histories um, and whether or not you needed any transfusions. And on the physical exam, among the most important things people are going to be doing is making sure that there's no palpable enlargement of the spleen. So the spleen early on in the fetus, before we actually have a lot of bones, the spleen is an important organ for blood to be producing. And when the bone marrow gets full, the body looks to other ancillary places where it can make blood, and the spleen is one of those. And so an enlarged spleen can tell me, when I'm thinking, it can say, oh, this spleen is pretty big. I wonder if the reason it's big is because the bone marrow is scarred down or fibrotic. And that is one of those clues on a physical exam. Another thing that's very important is a, a pretty good skin exam for people with MPNs because infiltration of the skin can give me a hint that there's some abnormality going on in cells that like to go to the skin and house themselves in the skin. In terms of the laboratory workup, we of course do our standard complete metabolic panel in CBC, and we'll take a look at that on a small, on a small uh, slide, um, and that, again, can help us see things. We'll test for whether or not people have abnormalities in how their blood clots. We'll look at the amount of iron in the blood. And then, because of the work that's been done since 2005 to illustrate the driver mutations, that's a phrase you'll hear a lot, we will then look for whether or not this person has abnormality in the JAK2 in the JAK2 genes. And if, because that's the most common, typically the way laboratories do it in a regular clinic setting, not in a research setting, but in a regular clinic setting, is first you look for JAK. And if the JAK2 V617F mutation is not is norm is not present, then you look for Cal R or the MPL mutation, or a mutation in the exon 12. So that's called reflex testing. And sometimes you go through that whole algorithm, and you end up with no mutations, but you end up still with these abnormalities you've seen on the CBC. And then you have to talk through, should we be doing deeper sequencing? Should we be looking at the entire uh, gene here to see what other mutations we can find? I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Now, another thing that we do, and some of my patients will say, do I really need to have this done? Can you really avoid it? But we do marrow, a bone marrow biopsy and aspiration. And that's because, one, it's required. The diagnostic criteria, and I'll show you that in a second, by the World Health Organization indicate that you really do need to look at the bone marrow to make sure you understand the diagnostics. And the second thing is because there's more and more information gathering that some of the other fi findings in the bone marrow, like what the genetics look like through cytogenetics, those can help you make predictions. Now, we aren't yet at a point where I can sort of absolutely foretell how everybody's disease is going to behave. Some of the sort of the website that Dr. Nagalia was talking about may help us with that, sort of you know, looking at a crystal ball and saying, this is what's going to happen to you, or this is what's likely to happen to you in the next 10 years or 20 years. However, some things like cytogenetics, like the amount of scar tissue in the marrow, like the molecular studies, can help us do that kind of forecasting. And that kind of forecasting can be both anxiety producing, but also can be reassuring and can help us guide therapy. And then finally, it's important to look for certain, uh, certain other mutations for imposters. 
uh, things like PDGFRA or alpha or beta, FGR, ABLE, those kind of things can sometimes, again, lead to alterations in the diagnosis. So all of these things, the first three are essential, and the last line is one I do in special circumstances. Now, for essential thrombocythemia, you need to look at the major and the minor criteria. The major criteria is uh, a platelet count more than 450, not once, but relatively two or three times. I don't want it just to be a single incidence. I want it to be something that's consistently found. Uh, bone marrow biopsy that looks like essential thrombocythemia and not meeting criteria for this thing called BCR-ABLE positive CML, polycythemia vera, primary myelofibrosis, myelar dysplastic syndrome, or something else. So rule out the imposters and a mutation in either the JAK2, the CALR, or the MPL. Now, as we've just heard about, about 10% of people with essential thrombocythemia will not be able to find a clonal marker. And that requires that you do a very thorough search for anything that could cause high platelets that is not a neoplasm, that is not occurring in the bone marrow. When you use the word neoplasm, I mean a disease that's arisen because of a a, a reproduction of cells in an abnormal way. But people can have high platelets without that, and you really need to sort of rule those out. And these are the World Health Organization criteria. So when we're making a diagnosis, these are the things we need to focus on. Now, just for a word for those who are newly diagnosed and may not have been through a bone marrow biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy is done in the back of the pelvis area. If you think about the pelvis and you think about those two little dimples on the top of the rump area, that's where the bone marrow sits only about a centimeter or two beneath the skin. So by numbing that area up and then going in and numbing the bone marrow up beneath that, you can use a small hollow needle. It doesn't look so small here. It probably doesn't look so small as you're laying on the table. But those that bone marrow needle goes in, and just like you might gauge the age of a tree or the age of a, 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 a glacier by putting a hollow needle in and pulling it out, we can tell a lot about that bone marrow by the, the, what we can remove. And among the things that we can tell is on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that we can take very thin slices and look at the blood smear and look and see, is this uh, bone marrow got a lot of early precursor cells, something we call blasts or abnormal, fast-growing stem cells? Uh, does it have a lot of abnormalities in the platelets, for example? So if you look on here, on one side of the slide, and I'll just point here, so these are normal platelet megakaryocytes. This is one of the, the early uh, kind of parents of platelets, and platelets um, actually are made by these megakaryocytes, and they're kind of spewed off, almost like, uh, like little bits and pieces that come off of the edge of them, but these are the cells that are important. They're called megakaryocytes. And you can see here that the the growth part of the cells is kind of clustered in one side, and there's all this other material here that looks relatively normal. Now, in essential thrombocythemia, these megakaryocytes can look abnormal. They can look like this, sort of separated out, or their, their growth material can be all spread out, taking up the entire area of the cell. Now, it takes a really good hematopathologist, which is somebody who trains just in looking at platelets, to be able to say, are these normal megakaryocytes or abnormal megakaryocytes? But that's one of the reasons that this bone marrow is important to look at, because these are very important distinctions to be made to really come at the diagnosis. And you can also have imposters, so things that might cause elevated platelets that have nothing to do with neoplasm in the bone marrow. And one of those, as mentioned, is iron deficiency. So a handful of times I've had people sent to me in my clinic who have platelets of 900,000, 800,000, so clearly high, but they also are low in iron. And one of the things that the bone marrow does when the iron level is low is try and overproduce what it can produce. If it doesn't have iron, they can't produce red cells. So instead, this kind of overactive bone marrow 
tends to push platelets into the peripheral blood, which can sometimes look like essential thrombocythemia until you actually take a look at the iron studies, take a look at the size of the red cells, et cetera. Another thing that can cause high platelets is when somebody's had damage to their spleen. Maybe their spleen was injured in a motorcycle accident, or maybe they've already had some problem where surger, surgeon took out part of their spleen. The spleen is a place where lots of platelets live, and if you take away some of that housing, those platelets then circulate around the body. And finally, some other cancers can cause high platelets. This is a picture of a translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, where they switch places and create a new part of a chromosome here, which is called the 922, or the Philadelphia chromosome. And that causes a condition called chronic myelogenous leukemia, which can sometimes be confused with essential thrombocythemia. And one of the most important things I do is make sure that the patients sent to me don't have CML, which has an entirely different way to treat it. So those are some of the imposters, and again, one of the reasons why you have to be clear. Another imposter, or not even imposter, another subtly different one is a condition called early primary myelofibrosis. Early primary myelofibrosis, if you do not look at the bone marrow can sometimes look a lot like essential thrombocythemia, but it's only when you look at the bone marrow and you kind of grade, is, I'm seeing a lot of fibrosis there, et cetera, or you look at other characteristics of the blood itself, you can diagnose early primary myelofibrosis. Now, this may not matter so much in the very early stages, but early prefibrotic myelofibrosis behaves differently than ET. Um, and it ha can have a, a, a faster rate of growth. Remember, we were hearing about that interest rate of clonal cells, and the interest rate in prefibrotic my myelofibrosis may be higher than the interest rate, so that accumulation of damage over time may be more rapid in patients with prefibrotic myelofibrosis. And so, again, it's an important distinction to make, and one that's going to make a difference in the way I counsel patients perhaps even how frequently I see them or whether or not I'm going to consider them for novel therapies or clinical trials when that comes about. You can see here, this just looks at the overall and leukemia-free survival, which may not be different in the early part of the disease, but does differ later on in the disease. Again, speaking to the interest rate of the acquisition of additional problems in the two diseases, and also speaking to the critically important angle of correct diagnosis at the beginning. So before we leave, before the first visit ends, I need to go through my checklist and make sure that I really know this patient has ET. And that's something I would invite all of you guys to go through with your doctors as well. Can we make sure that I've met the diagnostic criteria? Um, and if not, why not? So some things that can happen during diagnosis that can make that harder. And many times people arrive and they've never had a bone marrow biopsy. They've been diagnosed just on the basis of high platelets alone. Uh, or sometimes they've had a bone marrow biopsy that really wasn't sufficient. It didn't get the adequate number of cells or didn't look w well enough. Another thing is that we have to make sure those driver mutations, that that cascade of diagnostics have been uh, have been addressed. Now, in somebody where they've had a bone marrow biopsy that looks like essential thrombocytosis, where driver mutations have been tested for, but nothing has been identified, then I really need to double check. Are there any other secondary causes of high platelets that I've missed in some way? And this is a person with ET who I absolutely, even off of clinical trial, do next generation sequencing. It may be that's to look at other clonal mutations. It may be in the future or even in the very short-term future, everybody with ET should be, uh, should be sequenced um, so that we get that deeper level of genetic sequencing. But that's not necessarily going to make a clinical difference at this point in time. So it's not always something you can rationally ask the insurance companies to cover. 
clinical trials will also often cover that. I do think that in the short term, we may find much more prognostic information from that next generation sequencing. So that may be moving into the sort of standard of care clinic. Now, we've learned a little bit about this in essential thrombocythemia, JAK2V617S, this most common mutation is found in about 50 to 60% of cases. CalR, which is a mutation in this chaperone protein and can be of two types. You remember that slide that we saw before that said that sometimes that CalR was a little bit too bigger than normal and sometimes a little bit too smaller than normal. That speaks to the fact that there's two different kinds of mutation in this CalR protein that can both arrive at the presentation of essential thrombocythemia. However, they actually influence the future of essential thrombocythemia in slightly different ways. My, um, mutations in MPL happen in about 2 to 3% of cases. And as I said, depending on the studies that you look at, about 10 to 15% of people with essential thrombocythemia will not find a mutation in any of those three. And you need to be pay attention pay particular attention to those people. Now, we also know that some of these mutations can have some influence on prognosis. And when I start talking about prognosis, I want to be clear that this is not a prophecy. This doesn't say, if you have this, this will absolutely happen. All it does is describe a little bit about the balance of risk. Uh, people with CalR mutations versus JAK2 mutations tend to have higher platelets than those with JAK2. But that's a tendency. There's always going to be overlap. People with uh, CalR may have a slightly lower risk of vascular thromboses. So these are all about kind of making some guesses, but not about telling you this is absolutely what's going to happen. And we're still learning about how we can uh, understand the risk for arterial versus venous thrombosis. Arterial thromboses are the kind that happen in organs that are somewhat more dangerous because it's about the delivery of oxygen to those organs. Heart attack is an arterial thrombosis. Stroke is an arterial thrombosis. Venous thromboses are the ones that occur in the blood vessels that are bringing blood back from the body. So that's where you can have, for example, problems in the pulmonary embolism or in the pulmonary vasculature or in the gut vasculature. And we're still learning about how to not only quantify that risk, but also prevent those risks. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about in treatment. All right, so we've talked about presentation and we've talked about diagnosis. I next want to talk about risk stratification. And one of the most important things about risk stratification is to understand this concept. What are we talking about? Sometimes it's risk of overall survival. And so I can say, well, the way your disease looks gives you a, a X percentage of death from this disease in 20 years. So you all, oh, but sometimes that risk stratification is about the risk of a clot, or sometimes that risk stratification is about uh, the risk of um, a problem from a medication. So whenever somebody talks to you about risk stratification, you have to say, what is the consequence? What is the outcome that this is based on or that this is predicted for? You also have to think about based on which patients. So a risk stratification system that was developed for example, between 1990 and 2010, before the development of JAK inhibitors for myelofibrosis, might be different than one that was developed between 2010 and 2023, where we have more interventions available. So these predictive risks depend on which patients were included in the models that developed that risk. When were those patients treated? How were they treated? And the way I use risk stratification is when I'm sitting down with a patient and say, all right, what are the goals of treatment? What are the reasons to start treatment or the reasons not to start treatment? And it all depends on what outcome we're looking at and how we're going to weigh those goals and what medicine armamentarium has to achieve those goals. So what are the potential outcomes for patients with essential thrombocythemia? Well, debilitating symptoms can occur bleeding can occur, venous or arterial clots can occur, there is a risk for transformation to acute leukemia, 
and there's a risk for transformation to post-ET myelofibrosis. And in my experience, these are the kind of things that essential thrombocytemia patients most worry about. But I just want to emphasize that many patients with essential thrombocythemia will acquire none of those. And so before we start putting in medicines or putting in additional risks to try and avoid those, we have to understand what is the risk that those would happen. And one of the most robust ways that we can do this is this thing called the Revised International Prognostic Score for Essential Thrombocythemia. And I would say that currently this still represents the standard of care. So what is the outcome that this risk stratification score is looking at? It's looking at the risk of thrombosis-free survival. So they want to say, it, what is the risk that this patient sitting in front of me today will have a problem of either uh, will have a problem of getting a blood clot um, either in their arterial or vascular system. And individuals, they've determined that using four features, whether or not this person has an age over the age of 59, whether or not they have a lot of cardiovascular risk factors, whether or not they have previous thrombosis, whether or not they've had a clot in the past, um, or whether or not they have mutant JAK2 helps delineate people with ET into a very low risk category. That's when you have none of those. Into a low risk category where you are under the age of 59 and have a mutant JAK2 and no prior clot. That's a low risk category. People that are over the age of 59 or people that have a prior thrombosis or over the age of 59 and a mutant CALAR. And those people are in the ca high risk category. And that allows me to say, well, you know, you're, you're 63. Um, you've smoked for the first 20 years of your adulthood, although you've, you've not smoked now, and your mutant CALAR. I am afraid that puts you in a higher risk category for a clot. And I think we should therefore start an intervention. And so this helps me discuss with the, my patients what the, what the risk is we're trying to avoid and how we might do that. So I find this to be very helpful. Now, additional prognostic scores or additional risk stratifications are being developed that include, for example, other mutations. Um, and so I would say more to come on this. The more we learn, the more we can use this to help. And this is also just a discussion tool. This doesn't say that you absolutely have to do something the day of your birthday, but it does say over time, this is the risk that you're looking at, and it helps me do that risk versus benefit weight for any intervention we want to try. And this just goes through what are the risks of a clot in a percentage of patients per year, and sometimes taking a look at those numbers can be helpful for patients. So what are the key lessons when I'm going through this? Most of the time, the disease is indolent. The statistical calculations demonstrate that the risk for thrombosis is the biggest risk. And after that is a risk for transformation to myelofibrosis and a very small risk of transformation to acute leukemia. At the current time, we don't have any therapies that I can give someone that can prevent those transformations. So we focus on the ones we can prevent, which is thrombosis. You want to control what you can. Things like high cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, obesity, those really increase your risk for arterial thrombosis quite a bit, and maybe even vascular thrombosis. And so for those things, you want to stop those. And you want to make sure you screen for other cancers, because all myeloproliferative neoplasms have a higher rate, no matter what you do, interventions or not have a high, slightly higher rate of other cancers, including skin cancers and solid tumors. And so you want to be vigilant about getting your mammographies. You want to be vigilant about uh, prostate and colon cancer type of interventions because you want to prevent what you can. Oh, and also I want to just emphasize that indolent does not mean asymptomatic. Indolent means slow growing. It means that interest rate is low. But asymptomatic, can asymptomatic means you don't feel anything about having the disease, and that's not the case. We'll talk a lot in the course of the next two days about managing symptoms. And indolent does not mean you don't have symptoms. So I'm not trying to imply that people don't know that they're living with this disease in a way that matters. <laughs> 
So let's talk a little about, about treatment options. So for very low risk essential thrombocythemia, one of the most important things as a doctor is to not mess things up. We know that very low risks ET doesn't have a high interest rate. It's not going to cause problems in the short term. Uh, as long as people don't um, put their heart and vasculature additional risk from things like high blood pressure, smoking, et cetera, then many times they can live with very low risk disease for a long period of time. In fact, even a daily aspirin is not necessary for people with low risk disease unless they have a lot of symptoms. And aspirin can be very helpful for symptoms. It can be very helpful for that symptom I talked about of erythromyalgia, of itching or burning in the feet. It can be helpful for migraines. It can be helpful for itching for individuals that have that. So I usually use aspirin if people have significant symptoms. And then check with them by using a, a, a form that has them fill out what their symptoms are like, a form that was developed actually by Dr. Mess's team that can measure symptoms. And if that gets better with aspirin, that's great. If it doesn't, then we try and find something else that will help those symptoms. Now, individuals with low or intermediate risk disease, again, we manage cardiovascular risk factors. We talk, we put, in those individuals, I put them on aspirin once or twice daily. Now, there are a category of individuals with ET who should not take aspirin, and that's because they actually have a higher bleeding risk, and this can occur in people with a very high platelet count. In the past, a very high platelet count alone was a reason to give people a medicine to reduce their platelets. Um, and nowadays, we do that if the high platelet is accompanied by evidence of something called acquired von Willebrands. And acquired von Willebrands is when the platelets have interfered with the way that the clotting proteins work. So in this picture, you can see in the normal blood vessel, you've got these proteins. The proteins are the mortar that are used to kind of seal uh, injuries to the blood vessels, and the platelets are the bricks. And in a, normal blood, in a normal way that the blood vessel seals up after there's been an injury, the bricks are laid down and then the mortar goes in and that helps seal it. Well, it turns out there's a unique problem that can happen in people with thrombocythemia where the platelets kind of are so many, they cluster around the mortar and they prevent the mortar from being useful. And in those people, they got plenty of platelets, but it turns out that they can have a lot of bleeding. And typically that bleeding is in the form of gum bleeding, nose bleeds, maybe increased menstrual bleeding, rarely, for example, bleeding that is so severe people die, but it is something we need to watch out for. And when people have very high platelet count and these, this kind of bleeding that be characterized as acquired von Willebrands, then they may not take aspirin. They may not take other things that's in their blood until that platelet count is lowered enough that their blood vessel choreography can re uh, return to normal. Now, in some people, there's been an increased interest in whether or not once aspirin a day is, is required or twice aspirin a day is required. And there is a recent study that I'll point out that actually looked at how well aspirin works to prevent clotting activities. And this didn't look at how the patients did. This looked at how the blood produced a certain chemical called thromboxane 2. And what they determined after looking at in, uh, patients with ET who were on aspirin once a day, and they randomized to continuing them to once a day versus putting them on twice a day or three times a day, they found that the sweet spot here was twice daily aspirin in terms of reducing this clotting marker here of thromboxane 2. Now, this isn't quite ready to change the standards of care because the outcome wasn't about patients. The outcome was about this biomarker. But I do think this just sort of raises our antenna a little bit to continue to follow the information about whether once daily or twice daily aspirin is necessary to be adequate to prevent clotting of the platelets. Upfront therapy, I know many of you are very familiar with. There's hydroxyurea, there's pegylated interferon, and sometimes anagrolide. 
And the choice between these is really one of the bread and butter of our clinical conversation. And that involves going through some of the studies that support these, the oldest of which is with hydroxyurea. The newer ones uh, include pegylated interferon and anagrelide. And what we do in these conversations is go through the pluses and the minuses, look at the individual patient, and again, the goals of care. Uh, you're going to be hearing from some of the people that are speaking today are the lead authors of some of the studies that have investigated this. And so I, um, I want you to remember this is just a scaffolding and you'll hear more data later on some of these things. If we briefly talk about hydroxyurea, it reduces platelet counts rapidly. It reduces the thrombotic risk and generally it's very well tolerated. Now, when you'll hear on chat rooms or on the internet, you'll often hear about the people, people tend to post or when they've had difficulties, right? So there is a, a lot of people who talk about how difficult it is to take hydroxyurea. And yet in general, in relative in general practice, hydrea is actually extremely well tolerated for many people. That doesn't mean it's the right thing for many people. Many people, uh, if you have to take it for very prolonged periods of time, sometimes you can have risk, for example, for skin problems, skin cancers, difficulties with your nails. Sometimes it takes a lot to get you to the right, to right measurement. So generally, we try and adjust the dose of the hydrea for a, plate, a platelet count of less than 400,000, although I will tell you, there is no great evidence that it's actually the lowering of the platelet count that, what, that makes hydroxyurea effective. So in general, this is a conversation I have with patients. We go over the pluses and minuses and discuss whether or not hydrea is the right agent. Anagrelide, it works differently than hydrea. You have to take it several times a day. It gives you very good control of the platelets, but it can also have some side effects. Sometimes it makes headaches worse. There can be some cardiac toxicity, and a rarely fibrosis of the marrow can, be, uh, can occur. So again, if I need to talk, think about anagrelide on somebody, with somebody, I go over the pluses and minuses. We look at the clinical trials and determine if this is the right tool to use. And then finally, interferon. Interferon, pegylated interferon is a once weekly injection. It manages the immune system in a way that prevents the bone marrow from making new blood cells in, or blood uh, vessels in some way. It slows down the bone marrow and may have differentiating properties, meaning takes the bad cells and sort of asks them to behave more like good cells. What interferon is actually doing in the bone marrow at the molecular level remains a source of a lot of investigation and I think is something we'll be seeing more of in the next years or so. This is one of the new studies on looking at individuals with either essential thrombocythemia or polycythemia vera. And instead of starting them initially on hydroxyurea and then moving them to interferon, this says let's randomize people to starting hydroxyurea or interferon at the very beginning. And the takeaway for this is that these two therapies at 12 months appeared to be equivalent that there was uh, the primary outcome of normalized blood counts was the same for both arms. Now, whether or not that means that it's the same year two, year three, year four, we may hear a little bit more about from Dr. Mascarenas, who was one of the leaders of this study. And we do know that in polycythemia vera, the use of rogue peg interferon has shown in that second year to have a deeper remissions. But that was in polycythemia vera patients, not essential thrombocythemia vera patients. So uh, uh, essential thrombocythemia patients. So again, we continue to accumulate data on really the usefulness of patients with, uh, of interferon in patients with essential thrombocythemia. So these are some of the take home lessons. They all, all three of these individuals have a role in the treatment of disease. There's randomized data that interferon and hydrea control blood counts at that 12 month mark. There's long term risk for skin cancers and immune complications with both interferon and hydroxyurea, and you need to talk about those. And this is a really good way to have a discussion, a very personalized discussion with your physician. So when should you think about a clinical trial? When should you say, look, I wanna be in something investigational. Please 
uh, help me, and I have a picture of a guinea pig here, but don't think of yourself as a guinea pig because um, really clinical trials are an incredibly important way to give back to the research enterprise and in some cases can provide access to medicines that you might not otherwise have access to. So clinical trials are, there's a preclinical phase, that's experiments that are done in a laboratory or on stem cells or on mice. There's the clinical phase, which I'll talk about in a second, and then there's actually clinical trials that are done on drugs that are already approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Phase one trials are where you're just looking at the safety of something and whether or not it is okay to take in a human being. Those are less likely to cause benefit because the doses that you get are very, very low. Phase two studies are when you've already determined that this is a safe dose and we want to find out if that dose works, okay? Many times a phase two, you never get a placebo. You're just seeing, can we get any hint of activity in a given dose of a drug? Phase three are the largest studies and these are studies where half of the people or two thirds of the people take the new drug and the others take what's the standard of care and that's the best way to determine is the new drug actually benefiting people over the standard of care. You can't make that determination without something randomized. And phase four studies are ones where there is already a drug approved. Now. One of the things that was done in a clinical trial was looking at Jacophy, the drug ruxolitinib in essential thrombocythemia. That, that was a clinical trial that was done. And what they found was this was in patients that had essential thrombocythemia and hydrea was no longer work. And they randomized people to ruxolitinib versus what was otherwise best available. And they looked is there some benefit to complete remission or partial remission? They found that it was about the same, some symptom response on both sides, although the ruxolitinib patients tend to have a little deeper symptom relief and it lasted longer. And so in conclusion, it wasn't a lot better in terms of efficacy, but there might have been improvement in symptom responses. What about rogue peg interferon? It's already been studied in polycythemia vera, and now there's ongoing studies for rogue peg interferon in the treatment of essential thrombocythemia. It's different from pegylated interferon. It lasts longer, although it also has some of these common characteristics of being antiviral or antiproliferative. And it, we know that interferon, for example, pegylated interferon, does tend to work in essential thrombocythemia and can be tolerable. So again, there are studies going on of rogue peg interferon, the newer interferon, in patients with essential thrombocythemia. There is this new medicine called IMG7289, which is a new, a, completely different way to think about the stem cells and maybe change the way megakaryocytes, those platelet producing cells, uh, get activated. And this is a clinical trial that's going on now and has been, had some of the results presented. This patient is being done just in essential thrombocythemia, high risk essential thrombocythemia of people who are on what we call second line disease. And the latest report in June of last year showed that there, if people were treated for more than 24 weeks, about 83% had a response. And some others, are. Uh, there are some side effects though, at people's taste changes, they feel fatigue and constipation. Again, this is not yet, we don't yet know if this medicine is better than what would be the standard of care. Otherwise, that requires more of a longer follow-up and randomized studies. There is a medicine called Navitaclax, which is a bioavailable BCL2 inhibitor. This is kind of, again, being tested in patients with primary myelofibrosis, but may eventually be tested in individuals with essential thrombocythemia as well, in particular because it tends to lower that platelet count. And finally, I don't have a slide on this, but Dr. Nangalia mentioned the first ever antibody to CalR was presented at the American Society of Hematology last December and that study is moving into clinical trials this year. I just want to say a note on blood thinners. 
People with myeloproliferative neoplasms can take blood thinners that are called oral anticoagulants, although we don't know how well they work versus warfarin. If you need to have your blood thin, talk to your doctor about that. So a few conclusions. Know your diagnosis, review your risk stratification, and think carefully about the treatment choice. These are all opportunities for you to link up with your doctor. You are the link between your primary care doctor and your hematologist. And so you want to make sure that they are communicating well. Bring your own records back and forth. Ask about sharing EMR. Make sure that one doctor has the other doctor's cell phone number because communication between your providers is critical. Control what you can. Uh, a lot of things like those genetics, all those wonderful things that we learned about are not necessarily controllable. But there are things that are controllable, like your blood pressure, like your activity level, et cetera. So control those. Remember to get screened for other cancers. You want to make sure that you're decreasing your risk for solid tumor with early surveillance. Preventative health is very important, and that is mostly common sense. And finally, I just want to say thank you. I agree with Dr. Mess's comments initially. MPNs is one of those fields in cancers where the patients have made an incredible amount of difference by their advocacy, by their communication within one, between one another, and especially by helping those of us know what we need to research. So thank you very much. Thank you.